So this paper will explore the intricacies and problems of creating a digital archive. And the case study is a blue stocking hostess, entrepreneur and literary critic Elizabeth Montague and her approximately 8,000 extant letters, which are housed in different archives, public and private, and also across continents. So thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Um, Suzanne and I have known each other for a long time, and we're glad to actually, and I will highlight this later on, is we're going to work a little bit together also on Montague and de Chayere. So, um, who were, first of all, Elizabeth, who was Elizabeth Montague and who were the Blue Stockings? Elizabeth Montague was a pioneering literary critic, businesswoman and salon hostess and writer. And from her teens until her 80s, and she kind of crossed the whole 18th century, Montague devoted part of every day to composing business letters to the manager for coal mines and estates, also to architects, landscape and interior designers of her mansions, witty epistles to fellow female intellectuals, but also authors she patronized. And she also wrote lots of missives pursuing her political and religious interests. So we have at the moment about 8,000 surviving letters which are both sides of the correspondence. And the, the her letters or the whole archive has been described by Barbara Brandon Snorenberg in the dictionary, Oxford Dictionary of Natural Biography as amongst the most important surviving collections from the 18th century. The letters are to date largely unpublished except for archaic and often inaccurate selections of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And only scholars with times and funds to travel to the US and different UK libraries have had access to these papers. Now, the first Blue Stockings, uh, the Blue Stockings hosted um, different kind of salons and Montague was one of the most prominent um, salon hostess at the time. The other ones were Elizabeth Vesey and Francis Boscarven. And the Blue Stockings started sort of meeting in these um, quite informal um, settings from the 1750s onwards. And the second generation took the Blue Stockings name into the 1780s. And together these women and men um, invented a new kind of informal sociability and nurtured a sense of intellectual community and potential. These assemblies differed um, quite significantly from the traditional card playing um, gatherings at the time where the women were actually separated out from the men. Instead, they were about intellectual pursuits, polite conversations, but also philanthropic projects and publishing ventures. And the gatherings in some ways were similar to the French salons in their principles of polite sociability, but they were different because they they um, allowed different kind of social classes to mix and exchange ideas about politics, literature, culture, and also facilitated what I mentioned earlier, a kind of patronage between patrons and protégés. So um, Montague, for instance, patronized um, quite a lot of writers, um, working class writers at the time. So, oops, so you can see that Elizabeth Montague was a key player in important networks, communicated, and she also communicated with a wide range of correspondence across nearly the entire 18th century. This is exciting, but this is also a problem if you want to edit the letters. The label Blue Stocking became a brand name beyond the actual group of women. It came to designate, often pejoratively, a group of learned intellectual women. So I just wanted to pick up on two examples how the name was sort of um, carried forward. So this is the um, a, a Japanese magazine, but also a group of feminist women, and they called themselves the um, Blue Stocking 
Japanese Blue Stocking Society, and this was in the 1920s in Japan. And you can see also from the image here, they, they kind of dressed more progressively than traditional Japanese women did at the time. And then also, and I won't attempt to um, pronounce this, but the name Blue Stocking also carried on in in Dutch, in the Dutch language, it was used um, from the 19th century onwards. And this is an image from an exhibition in 1959 in Utrecht, um, which featured, for instance, Anna Maria van Schuurman as an example of the early blue stockings. The charity and digital project, the Elizabeth Montague Correspondence Online, and I see later on if I can show you just a couple of pages of this, is an open access digital project to digitize, annotate and publish all extant letters written by Elizabeth Montague to a range of correspondents who were all crucial members of 18th century polite society. And I said at the moment, we've kind of divided it up. We're only publishing the letters written by Elizabeth Montague to the correspondents. Our edition is searchable and it will be therefore a major resource for researchers specializing in literature, history, art, history of art, architecture, theater, philosophy, politics, and so on. And it will also virtually reunite and order a crucial archive of the 18th century, showcasing newly discovered letters, but also restoring valuable letters to the British public. So it's a kind of heritage project in some ways as well. It will also raise awareness, like the um, Isabelle de Chayer letters as well, the important role played by women in the Enlightenment and stimulate, hopefully, new research. So we started off with a couple of network grants and smaller grants um, to, to bring together a group of very experienced editors to launch this project some years ago. The correspondence will be published in parts by correspondence. We decided to kind of divide it up like this. So each part will have its own critical introduction, maps, biographical sections. And then images of the original manuscripts will be provided alongside diplomatic transcriptions. Right. So we layer the text that the, the user can have um, the plain text or the diplomatic transcription with lots of explana explanatory notes. So we're catering for scholars, but also for non-specialist readers um, who are interested in the period. So EMCO had to tackle and is still tackling quite a lot of um, challenges here, which are methodological, but also structural. Number one, and I'm or A, I will go through them bit by bit, is first of all to trace all extant letters by Elizabeth Montague and the process is still going on. Number two, also to marry the extant correspondence located in different archives into one big digital archive. And then number three, to develop tools beyond the transcription annotation process, fostering novel methods of scholarly research and debate which utilizes the opportunities offered by digital resources and methods. So it's partially tool driven, but I want to talk about this a little more. Now, I think hopefully you can see this. Um, I come to the first point. Montague's early editor, Emily Clymanson, said the following of dealing with Montague's correspondence. And I think everyone in, working on um, letter correspondences will sympathize. Owing to the enormous quantity of letters undated, the sorting has been terribly difficult and I spent an entire winter in making up bundles labeling each year. My grandfather made a variety of mistakes as to the dates of letters. This is Matthew Montague. I hope I have atoned for some of his deficiencies, though a few mistakes are probably inevitable. He nearly blinded himself by walking at night. My grandmother had constantly to copy the letters in a large round hand to enable him to make them out. <laughs> so um, we all sympathize with Clymanson and Clymanson was very realistic about her task. She knew that um, 
many dates would remain provisional. This is, in fact, one of the problems that we have at the moment, that we have this enormous bulk of letters and we have problems with dating them. And often you can only date them once you read through them and annotated them, right? But what, what is very clear is that Elizabeth Montague's collection is unique because of its, its span across the 18th century, but also... Um, because of its, its number of letters. So what Clymenson did, like her grandfather, was she merely culled selected passages for publication and framed them with the biographical narrative, which you've got here on the left-hand side. Now, she died before the task was completed, and her friend, the historian Reginald Blunt, felt duty-bound to bring it to a conclusion. So to date, extracts from only about a third of the letters that we know of have been published. So to speak to the point number one that I made is there are hundreds of Montague letters cared for in Britain and the British Library, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, the University of Libraries at Aberdeen, Manchester, Nottingham, Longley, then in the US, the Lewis Walpole Library, Cornell and the Houghton Library in Harvard. Other collections are also still in private archives, for, in, for instance, the Longleat Archive. And then we also have some letters, for instance, in the Princeton collection, which is the correspondence between Elizabeth Montague and Francis Reynolds. Now, the thing is that we're still discovering new letters in these archives. Often what we found is that the catalogues are not necessarily accurate or do not display all of the available letters in detail. And so um, the, our research assistant, Dr. Anna Senkiv, and I, we've been kind of fiddling around trying to figure out how to access these letters and a description of these letters as well. But then also by accident, we find more materials, for instance, on Elizabeth Montague's activities in the north of England, and we found recently some boxes in the Time Wear archive about her collieries. So you can see that this is very exciting, but of course it will sort of prolong the project in some ways because we keep finding new letters. Point number two I made, and I just return quickly back to if that's okay, I hope you can see this now, to marry the extant correspondence located in different archives. So how do we do this? We've got all these letters across the US and Britain. The majority of the manuscripts are in fact located at the Huntington Library in California. And here also the letters, as we know from the librarians, are in use constantly. Um, they're good conditions, more or less, because the paper quality was better in the 18th century than in the 19th century. And Montague insisted on um, really good paper and she, she patronized a female stationer and bookseller and wrote in 1757, pray send in my name to Mrs. Desnoyers at the Golden Bible in Lyle Street for an hundred of the best pens and half a ream of the finest and thinnest quarto paper ungilt and let them come down in your portmanteau. Um, Digitization, of course, would help preserve these finest and thinnest papers. There are about 7,000 pieces, chiefly letters, in the Huntington Library. They are arranged in 117 boxes plus one album containing five to seven images. So this makes it 6,930 items to be scanned. Many of the letters consist of multiple pages, as Montague's letters are longer than average. They are about four to five pages. So in the end, we estimated about 37,000, 38,000 um, images to be um, scanned in. And then what we also have is um, a description of the letters at the front of each folder. So we also scanned the folder information as well. This made in total around four to 5,000 scans, which number one is a huge amount of work, estimated about 2,000 hours to digitize everything and also would disrupt the running of the library 
for many months and we managed with a kind um, donation of a, a private donor but also the collaboration with the hunting library to do this but if you think about this the scanning in is nothing to the amount of work which would have been put in if we had to be going physically to the hunting library and then and then work just there so what we've also done is coming back to Clymanson's point about uh, chronology and dating is, we were able to compile an inventory, which we of course have to update every time we find new letters or letters are redated and reordered in that way. So it's a constant work. Which brings me to the, the next bit, um, which is about developing tools beyond the transcription annotation, fostering novel methods of scholarly research and also debate, which utilize the opportunities offered by digital resources and methods. So in the title, I talked about the infinite archive. Now, Dan Cohen, who coined this expression, meant something slightly different. Um, he highlighted the possibility that in our digital age to source and explore all information as researchers, so think about research papers or systematic literature reviews, would be out of date by the time they're published. It's this kind of the constant updating through the internet. But actually, Cohen also talks about creating a digital history and new methodologies used if we use digital materials for study and research. He would call, I think, what we've established with EMCO an intentional archive, a focused and guided digital archive of a very specific amount of sources, or at least a very specific type of sources, which are the manuscript letters um, by Elizabeth Montague. So we are already excluding some information from our intentional archive. We are not at the moment transcribing the letters um, to Montague as we do not have the capacity nor the funding for that. We do make materials available if we have them so the readers or users can access them. We also use the digital tools to provide open access materials. We make links to um, open access um, Shakespeare editions, for instance, and other book editions. We also make other scholarly materials available to the public without a paywall. So readers can engage directly with the images of the letters, even if we haven't transcribed and edited them. So I guess what we are doing is, yes, we've got an intentional archive, but we are also creating a digital scholarly edition with classifications and annotations. So we're doing two things. And any form of classification or mapping of the archive is in fact an act of authority, which opens up new avenues to its material, but also closes of others. And we're quite aware of that. But as we know from Clymanson, an unordered archive would be the archivist's nightmare one in which the scholars and archivists journey through the library in search of some ultimate order would be some kind of mystic revelation. So we can't do that. So the Montague project is there to exploit and explore new possibilities for the genre of a scholarly edition and a scholarly archive through the collaboration of a group of experts in editing and digital humanities. So the viewer can, but doesn't have to, look at the notes and the scholarly apparatus. So, and here you have an example of, they're not the same letters of one of the letters here. You can see um, the handler writing in general by Elizabeth Montague is fairly clear, which is great. But you can also see already that there's some crossings out and some people added. Um, the Mrs. Montague dot Dr. Beatty is from one of the editors of the Beatty letters. And then you can see on the left hand side, and I hope you can see this, is that you've got the footnotes, how we how we um, order them. These are the scholarly footnotes that we have here. Um, oops, sorry, I just meant to leave that up here. So 
we also pay attention to the physical objects themselves. So in the headers, which you don't see here, we look at the watermarks, the ink, the fold marks and seals also of the manuscript letters. Um, things often missed by the camera. So if we have that information, we put it in. Yeah. Um, we really, um, we unfortunately, what we don't have are some of the enclosures. We have the poetry at times, but Montague also sometimes sent objects or food or something. Obviously, we don't have that anymore. So if we know about the content, we make a note to that. So I guess what I'm arguing here for is that we're trying to democratize the archive by making it all available to the users and readers with as little um, censorship and little sort of restrictions as possible. But we're also using and kind of working on developing further digital use tools to allow users to access more information and also interpret the information. We do have a search function and inventory and a bibliographical information. We have information on the provenance of the letters and also on the postal system. What we're going to do in the future is to think about data visualization. So at the moment, we're just Google, using Google Map data to connect the correspondence of Elizabeth Montague to geographical locations. So what we want to do next is actually to uh, step this up a little bit. We were given, given a grant by the British Academy to develop a pilot project actually linking our letters to the Chayer letters. And we want to capture three different pieces of information. Number one is we want to think about geographical links between Elizabeth Montague and um, continental salon women writers, politicians. We also want to establish a kind of temporal timeline and thirdly, we want to establish a social network map. So the underpinning here is to understand social circles, not only as one in time, but also in geography. This is not terribly new as such, because some of you might know the mapping the Enlightenment maps or mapping the Republic of Letters, which is, I think is at Stanford. And these are really fruitful applications to um, visualized um, digital data. So what we want to do ultimately is to map the social and intellectual geography of 18th century Europe, um, to chart the different social and intellectual circles and the cross-cutting contacts between um, more central salon cultures and perhaps also the lesser known ones this is this is the the aim so we want to um we want to be able to allow the readers and users then to come up with a quite a kind of tight and detailed multifaceted analysis and we are really looking forward to collaborating with the Chayer letters in kind of piloting this. The, the crossover between Isabel de Chayer and Montague is minimal. They're just a kind of a handful of, of people who appear in both correspondences. But actually what this will allow us to do is really test out our new methodologies and data tools and then work from there. So I just wanted to stop here and... Um, and have I got one moment to show you perhaps a... Hopefully I can... No, I can't show it to you. What I might do is put into the chat or later on in a link the... Um, the link to the Elizabeth Montague letters online and all of you can perhaps experiment with them and and um, try them out and see how we've ordered them and how we've edited them as well. So I want to stop here. Thank you so much.